Hey everyone, welcome to Your Desk University. We are a group of computational designers and software developers in the AEC community that really wanted to come together to not only educate, um, but also unite the, the computational community in the AEC industry. And we know that you are one of those people. Of course, if you're involved in computational design, you probably have an idea that has something to do with Grasshopper, but really telling us the tool isn't necessarily telling us how. And we're gonna dig more into that. We love your questions, your comments, your engagement. Um, if you can hit the like button, really not for me, but for YouTube to tell everyone that we're live, that these things are helpful and interesting. If you don't find it interesting, then I mean, there's always that other button, or you can let us know what we could do better to make this um, work for you and your people. So with that, I will introduce our speaker. Let's pause and get to um, our speaker. This is Georgios, but I'm <laughs> blessed um, to have him as a coworker. Um, it's fun on your desk university to talk about all kinds of people, but it's also fun sometimes to talk about people that work at my firm. And Georgios um, and I worked together on the AU Design Slam and a couple of their projects over the last um, year. And I'm grateful to him and the Enclosure Engineering Group and what they do. And I just don't want to take much longer to introduce him. So with that, uh, Georgios, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, thanks, Timo. First of all, thanks for having me on the on the platform, and uh, it's a it's a pleasure to share as you know as much as I can at least. Uh, really, really quick. I uh, background. I originally come from um, a, a bachelor's of engineering, um, and and kind of like switched to architecture, uh, and and now I'm basically with Walter P. Moore, the, uh, almost approaching the five years mark. And in, um, I'm part of the enclosure engineering uh, group, as you mentioned, which is a sub group of the structures engineering. And um, I focus, um, my specialty as I guess is a digital designer. So I'm, I'm residing in Los Angeles. So I'm probably gonna be using uh, the like word probably too many times okay um and and you work on some of the craziest buildings don't you uh yeah sure i mean through my experience um to, to my kind of like work career it's it's been it's been a it's been a fascinating journey i have to say that um from from hotels in azerbaijan to uh complex disney projects to projects like uh, lucas museum um and and now I'm focusing mainly on the kind of like a, the typical enclosure engineering, um, doing some some you know more traditional facade projects. Basically, the one the one kind of like timeline that I was I was mainly involved uh, was um, mainly evaluating the surfaces, and kind of like uh, the surfaces that we were seeing from the architect, and kind of like doing this back and forth between us, making sure that their fabrication. Um, ready and at the same time making sure that the architect was happy with uh with the deviation that those re-sculpture surfaces or so you would um, get a surface yeah. and then you would try to make it more constructible more buildable buildable and then you would provide it back and say did we meet your your design intent is that what you're saying so yes uh yes i'm saying that and that's one part but um as as a lot of as a lot of uh, people that have worked with architects. So the main the main aspect of that first timeline is that the architects are usually using uh, um, software that that allow them to sculpt some surfaces, right? But those surfaces, when they're sculptured, they're not necessarily ready for fabrication. So our task on this specific uh, part of the project was to evaluate the surfaces, make sure that they smooth enough, so any any breaks in the continuity of the of the curvature uh, that could be seen uh, could be seen uh, from the human eye when they're fabricated do, do not exist right but once you're sculpturing a surface you you want to make sure that the deviation from the original surface is not is not that high right so you're not basically affecting the design you're you're basically developing the design you're not affecting it in a sense that you're alternating right Mm -hmm. So that that was the first fo the fo the focus on that first aspect of the of the project. Uh, was that was that was that clear? Did that? Uh, I think so. Your question. I think so. Okay. Then the second one, the second timeline is okay. You you're sculpturing the surfaces, and that's in a sense going on. But on the on the other hand, you have to have some tools to 
um, to change between the design and the engineering software, right? So basically, as we all know, uh, there's there's some there's as much as you, you can do within the Rhino Grass software as you mentioned earlier environment, but when it comes to heavy engineering, you you need to understand how how to how to properly mesh um, any surface and not only properly mesh it for FEA analysis with the final element analysis, but also um, add features to to that to that uh, mesh. Um, as I'm saying, like over there, which is basically the tertiary steel and the and the secondary steel that basically link the the, pan, the, the panel ribs back to the back to the primary structure, right? Um, hopefully that's that's clear as well, correct? That was a question for you, Tim. Oh yeah, I'm not I sure think so. if you... oh, yeah. Okay, all right. Uh, starting starting the starting the um, the presentation, I I'm going to focus a little bit as as I, as I mentioned on the sculpturing of the surfaces um, by the architect and what this back and forth would look like and how would the how then we would evaluate those surfaces and make sure that they're um, they're on the right track for for fabrica fabrication. So you know one of the one of the things that I that that always come to mind when, when it comes to architecture is how you can how you can actually um, widen the spectrum and and go go and look what other industries are doing where where you need uh, like high fidelity of surface treatment and um, and so basically take a concept that applies to in a sense smaller smaller objects could be like cars or um, or or like jewelry so so in a sense higher definition of, of surface uh, uh, qual uh, quality and then in a sense uh, scale them up right so that's exactly what we did we we basically um, we basically looked at we looked at the what the automotive industry is is heavily leaning on and and we realized that uh, they have been using the um, those uh, what they call diagnostic sh shaders for the uh, curvature continuity and those are basically uh, those are the, the, the um, diagnostic shaders are basically two big groups. The one is the horizontal and vertical, um, which are now also known as, as zebra stripes. And so basically, you're um, you you're basically shooting a uh, you're shooting a surface with basically like a, a bank of strip lights. And and you can you can either have like you can have those three bank of strips either uh, vertically or horizontally, and then the second one is basically the iso angle, which you what you're doing you're basically moving that bank of strip lights along the surface. Well, we basically used uh, we basically used um, mainly the the zebra stripes uh, for the evaluation, and I'm gonna just really briefly briefly ex explain what the zebra stripes are because it's basically. Um, it's basically some. It's basically a method to understand the curvature and continuity between two adjacent surfaces, and and the, and uh, if anybody looks 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 those up, there are basically three three kind of like main kind of categories of curvature and continuity, and and um, in a sense, the, uh, there is a pre so which means which means that for you to achieve curvature of as you see in the screen G two. You need to have uh, G0 and G1 uh, already already tackled. So basically, um, I'm gonna again like briefly explain. So G G0 is basically um, the lowest con the lowest continuity level and basically measures the gap between the two surfaces, right? So if you have a gap, you you can see that basically the how the zebra how the zebra stripes are br are broken um, in quotes and. So the moving the, the G1, it's kind of like a, a, a more high, higher level um, curvature continuity as, as G0, G0. And basically the way the way it's easy to understand it is basically not only the two faces meet, which means that the G0 is, um, is satisfied and at a common edge. At the same time, the uh, tangent, the tangent plane at, at the tangent plane at each point of this um, along of this edge is uh, is the same for both for both faces. And so G zero they're so touching, in G one mm -hmm. they have the same. I'm getting a little too loud. Sorry guys. In no G one they're 
they're they have the same curvature or kind of direction the, at that point. And at G G two right. they 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 have that reflective smooth look. Um, Right and yeah, I mean it's, it's um, so basically the G two the G two is also called uh, ra radial continuity and basically not only they're meeting, not only they are tangent, tangent, not uh, the two surfaces not only are meeting, not only the planes are tangent, but at the same time the rate of the um, curvature change along at the along at this edge where they're meeting is is the same for for both surfaces and faces. So it's kind of like a level and curvature G2 is basically what they call the A level of uh, alpha level of um, of curvature continuity, which is basically the is basically what we're hoping uh, we're aiming for. Right. We don't want any breaks on the surfaces when when they come together. Um, so so because imagine like we're, we're talking about panels that are really, really big and um, and so uh, any difference in the curvature uh, between those panels when those two panels meet can actually uh, and the way and the way the sun hits those surfaces can be visible from the human eye. So you want to be careful when you when you're evaluating your surfaces and, and you need to understand that that kind of like curvature um, uh, continuity uh, principles in a sense, right? So it's not so, just like the surface continuity, it's also curvature continuity, which gives you that that smooth reflection like you would see at the Bean in Chicago um, and now maybe in, in this museum. Correct, correct. Um, so so here I, 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 I pulled up some, some examples from uh, for you guys. Uh, on the left-hand side, we have the original panels and there's two tools that you can use within the Rhino environment. The one is the zebra stripe, and the other one is the environment map, uh, and the environment map looks like a more of a, like a beam of light that you can um, that it's been reflected along the surfaces. But for instance, on the left hand side, you can see we have we like on the original surfaces you, you have breaks at the even within even within the panel, right? So which means that the kind of like the curvature within the panel is 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 not is not well defined. And so you can see after the treatment that we went through um, that now the discontinuity uh, within the panel panel panels are now resolved, right? Um, and if anything, you kind of like want to push that discontinuity on the panel edges because there's also um, the, uh, a seam. So it's it's a, it's again like uh, it's all like the the amazing thing. It's all like um, on the eye of the beholder in a sense, right? So you you there's always a visual check and there's, there's there's different we had different people checking um checking for these discontinuities at different levels because if you spend if you spend looking at the zebra stripe on a on a building for i don't know maybe like a couple of weeks then you you just basically sit that on your in your sleep so we had we had different people kind of like doing the back check and 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 making sure that uh, the results are Acceptable for for um, for the di for different um, sp uh, speci specialists, if you will, um, and and so one of the one of the things that I wanted to bring out is is kind of like the garbage in garbage out um, idea, right? So the one of the things that you have to be careful and uh, and you can you you can already see that there's not going to be curvature continuity if you have uh, a good surface, right? And your and even your ISO curves, you can see on the left hand side, they were um, we were assuming them in a sense kind of like jumbled. So we have to, in a sense, rebuild the surface, make sure that the um, ISO curves are um, uh, are tidy in a sense, right? And that I was actually was reflected in a sense when when we're using the zebra the zebra tool, right? So that the uh, the 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 reason for us going and rebuilding the surfaces was basically to stop these discontinuities and you can see on the left hand side which are pretty 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 big right and you can see how on the right hand side those those have been smoothened out um so how do how do you actually reshape a surface um for for the simpler for the simpler panels, we what we did is that we basically went with a simpler approach, right? So we said um, get the panel boundary, so we know that basically all adjusting panels are uh, are 
are actually satisfying these um, all this like the boundary conditions on four sides of that panel. So we're not really moving the panel out of its place, right? And and then basically we would segment this panel along the along one of the boundaries and get sectional curves and then sweep that panel. That is that is one of the approaches that someone can use. Um, the the one thing that I have to say on that uh, on that aspect is that basically um, you it's not it wouldn't it wouldn't be it wouldn't be for a surface that needs really you you really need to control the deviation from the original surface could not be the ideal um, ideal tool for that but for the majority of the for the majority of the surfaces um and ar in architectural surfaces that could be that could be a you just take the surface way. slice it through with a bunch of planes find those curves and then just make a new rebuild that curve and for those so, yeah. who are grasshopper savvy uh, what are your favorite re curve rebuilding nodes i don't know if we're going to oh, get live this. into grasshopper messing around or not um but maybe you can I, at least I, share I, that yeah, I try to stay away from that mainly because every every workshop or slash presentation that I've done online with Rhino is is ends up in a in in chaos. So I uh, that's why I, I've I've made for you what what I what I did on this presentation is that I, I I pulled up some some videos of me doing some work and also found videos that could help the viewers understand a little bit what each tool is doing that I'm uh, that I'm gonna show. This one was a, a little more self-explanatory. Um, Timon, that's why I, I I didn't really in a sense, in a sense uh, pull any videos. Um, but for the next tool, which which I was I was really excited to see um, in the works, uh, and I have a video to show you guys is uh, is basically the the surface reconstruction using X NURBS, and that's um, basically like a like an add-on for uh, for Rhino. I haven't so, used X NURBS, uh, so that'll be cool. Yeah, so let me, uh, I'll, for a second, I'll just close this presentation and show the video because uh, we can solve really complex problems in engineering, but like adding a video in a presentation when you're doing InDesign is, is, is more complex. Well, so, while you do that, for those who are watching this um, with the comments below or in the chat over there, tell me what your favorite ways of rebuilding meshes are. Have you ever rebuilt a mesh? Do you have a favorite curve? Um, favorite node, favorite um, add-in you've used, um, let other people know about it, um, either below or to the side. All right, well, that, you pulled it up. Let's yeah, Timon, you, you, uh, you're saying about re uh, rebuilding surfaces, but yeah, we, we'll get, you're so eager to get to the meshing part, which we'll get oh, in a second. Oh, my bad. Um, but rebuilding yeah, surfaces. For now it's, don't want to uh, get surface. ahead of my game. Sorry, I'm using the words <laughs> here. It's okay, we're all excited, it's fine. <laughs> Um, so yeah, this is this is uh, how basically XNERBS uh, work works, and it um, it's really it's a really cool it's a really powerful tool. I'll, I'll play the video in a second, but you can basically select the the, the boundary curves, uh, and you'll see you'll see you'll see how we like you can add the boundary curves, and then uh, you can control the curvature con curvature continuity. If you can see, it has like G zero precision, G one precision. Um, and and also at the same time have the zebra preview, so it's kind of like all, all in one type of deal. Uh, so that's why I think it's a really powerful tool for people that really want to have a, uh, a good um, uh, a good control over uh, the surface quality that they're rebuilding. So here you you can select your boundaries. And you have already defined that you want the G2 continuity, as we said earlier. So you recreate it. Um, and let me just pause it here just to show the, the zebra, right? So once it pulls out the zebra for the whole thing, right, you can see, you can see basically you can't even understand where the where the where the like the joints of the new surface that you're built up uh, are, right? So the continuity you can see how the how the zebra the zebra stripes are are really smooth it's a really powerful tool i i know it comes with a cost and it's unfortunately not free for rhino um but it's definitely worth it for people that uh, want to do this kind of curvature um as surface uh rebuild uh exercise so i strongly suggest that that um okay let me go back to my presentation
So moving for, from the surface reconstruction, uh, we're basically going uh, to, to kind of like the, as I said, the, the, the B timeline, right? Where surfaces are being translated um, to meshes and, and, and engineer, uh, engineered on, we actually use strand seven um, to apply all the material properties and, and run, the, run the analysis to understand the displacement. Uh, at the same time, uh, as, as we're figuring out more of the connection to, uh, between the secondary and the primary, we're adding features to these meshes, which would be, in a sense, uh, steep, any stiffener, uh, any pins that, that, need to, that need to be added to the mesh to, to make it um, stable. So I'm just basically showing a little bit of an exploded axo of the, build, of the FRP buildup. Um, and you know you you'll have your you'll have your uh, FRP panels and your kind of like backup structure. So and that's kind of like a close up of, and I'm explaining basically what are those features, what do those features mean um, in 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 kind of like the modeling aspect, right? So you you know you, you have a mesh, but at the same time you, you're not really like meshing the meshing just the panel itself. It's not. Yeah, it's not really doing anything for you. You the you need to understand how basically the um, how the forces kind of like are being translated uh, in, back into the backup structure. So you need to you need to be adding elements to those mesh um, and and trans and, and understand the the, lo the load transfer. So I I know that I know that um, that the the var the um, the spectrum of the audience in this on this during uh, on this uh, platform is, is pretty diverse. So, and one of one of our, our colleagues, uh, Timon, actually told me that a lot of times when you're talking with um, with in a crowd of, of like a mixed background, you have to you have to assume that they know uh, less than you than you're actually showing. So, in a sense, I'm, I I was just wanted to put a couple of slides. Uh, why are we using those meshes? So, um, people that are already aware of those, um, forgive me, but um, people who are not, I'm, I'm sure that they're going to get something out of it. So basically, the, the, basic, the basic idea of the finite element analysis is that you can't really run a finite element, um, element analysis in a, in, a, um, in a sense, in, a, in an infinite degrees of freedom, which, which a surface has, right? So you're basically taking a surface and you're breaking it in, in smaller pieces, which now it's kind of in a sense fine, finite number of points and, and finite number of elements that you can run your, and that's that's why the fi uh, finite element analysis comes comes from. So um, there's a lot of there's a lot there's a lot of mathematics involved behind behind that. Um, the way I like to think it is is basically it's just, it works a meshing, the meshing works basically as the integral works. So if you have, but in, in 3D, right? So if you have, mm -hmm. if you have a curve, you basically want to approximate this curve by dissecting it in, in straight segments, right? So that's, if you, that's the same concept, but it's just if you take it uh, in the, in the 2D domain, right? So, um, so you're basically creating discrete, discrete elements that, that then you can, uh, you can analyze. And, like I again, uh, just trying to simplify, uh, explain this concept is um, I have like a triangular mesh just to explain uh, what what uh, how that you know the components that kind of in a sense create a mesh and you have the node which is basically those vertices you have the edge which is the line element um, the face of the the face of the of the mesh and then uh, a face normal that basically shows the, the direction of yeah. The, we all know what a normal to a to a, to a face is, uh, and, not, and like I'm including another uh, really quick, uh, in a sense, code of what what a mesh is. It's basically a subdivision of a continuous geometric space into discrete geometric and topological cells. I, I really like that that description. Um, so we're. It's. Uh, I'm sure that a lot of people that have have tried to to. Um, uh, to mesh anything, they have been scratching their heads. There's a lot of there's a lot of tools out there that, in a sense, do the same thing or or um, or not necessarily not. And there's a lot of grasshopper tools there, the native uh, meshing tools, the Mesh Plus. Uh, there's the Kangaroo stuff, uh, which which everything is great, and and I feel that everything has its place. Um, 
what I what I re was really happy to find is that, uh, and it, for me, it was a pretty exci exci exciting kind of in a sense upgrade was that uh, Rhino Seven came up with uh, the quadri measure, and it's a really powerful tool. I can't I can never like really explain how 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 powerful this tool is. Uh, it's the, the the really powerful um, thing that that um, uh, this tool offers is basically its simplicity, and um, I have another. It's more of a it's more of a advertisement video that that shows how it works. Uh, it has some not necessarily architectural elements, but it was pretty cool to see how they how they basically. How by using this tool you can actually um, simplify those some some really I would say bad meshes, but in a sense, you know you can clear out your um, your me your meshing like pretty easily, and it has really it has it comes with a with a settings component where you can basically change the the density of that mesh, and you can also add guide curves if you if you specifically want specific curves to be added on your mesh. And it's a pretty handy tool. It, it, it's kind of like really as simple as it gets. And honestly, um, because meshing is is always a step between uh, evaluate, surface evaluation and engineering, you kind of want to have it as simple as possible, right? Um, and are you using, you're losing a lot of detail when you go about that? Uh, the, no, because it also has, a, I, if I'm not mistaken, it actually has um, a way for you to control the deviation between the between the original uh, the original B rep and the and the final mesh. So they they've done a really good work of um, of of you being able to control the the quality of the mesh. Um, so I would I would say that the deviation was would wouldn't be noticeable. Um, for yeah. I was just using yeah, it just the other day um, and generating an analysis model, so it's good to see that you approve it. <laughs> yeah, um, and the the quadri measure goes hand in. So uh, one more step, which I'm not really necessarily showing here, is basically when you triangulate the mesh, right? Because a quad mesh could be flat, but not 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 always. You actually for for the, the if you if people have used can, um, Caramba. For instance, uh, with, which is native in Grasshopper, uh, not native in Grasshopper. I mean, you can work. work um, it lives within Grasshopper, whereas Trans Seven doesn't. For instance, you need triangular meshes. So that that tool with the triangulate the triangulate mesh tool, it, it, it's really like a. It, it actually like, it's it's a pretty it's a pretty powerful tool. So I would, that's why I'm saying hallelujah. Like honestly, for me, it was it was a big uh, it was a big step on on the on that meshing part. And a lot of designers are scratching. You know, I, I come from a sense of designer background, and and it was all has always been a challenge to find the correct tool for the right uh, right mesh. Um, let me just put this back on the full screen mode. Okay. So. Uh, so you have your mesh, as we said, like we we were heavily leaning on the quadri measure at, at that point. And uh, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, one of the, in a sense, second steps is, is OK, you have the mesh, but then you, you know, you have to add your um, stiffeners, you have to add your pins, you have to add all these all these points. And you so basically you have a mesh, but you want to control this mesh and do do like a little bit of surgery in a sense, like local surgery on the mesh to to manipulate it in a sense that you that is usable for our for your uh, FEA and uh, final element analysis. And and so I have a video of uh, of a simple concept. Again, I'm again I didn't want to create uh, to make things look so complex. So it's a simple concept that uh, that that when it's scaled up, it's pretty powerful. I made another video for that, um, where you basically start with your panels and sp as B-reps. You start with your tertiary steel, um, and the so the first thing is of course you as we said like you come meshing your b rip with a quadri mesher to to come up with a clean mesh um then you basically extending your tertiary steel to make to ensure um, intersection uh you're deconstructing the mesh to get its vertices um and you can just to keep the mesh uh the mesh um layout consistent what you can do is basically 
find the find that the closest uh, the closest mesh point or mesh vertex to that to that point that you just just um, found when you're intersecting your tertiary steel with your uh, with your mesh, and basically just do a in a sense a replacement, right? So then then you at least you can still in a sense uh, triangulate that and and always in a sense come up with uh, like tri like triangular meshes. So. That was that was another concept that that's pretty powerful. We 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 kind of like lean lean on it uh, a lot. Um, and you're not able to mesh it with like guide points um, with the quad remesher, can... where you are definitely want to hit specific points and quad remesh. Would you have to split the surface first, or? So you know how you know how um, again. I'm not an expert in meshes, mm -hmm. but think, think, thinking thinking uh, right now is. You know how a mesh is always defined by uh, so when you're basically looking at a, how a mesh looks like, you have there's a sequence of there's a sequence uh, that the, um, each each phase has like basically a sequence of um, like it's Q uh, it's Q1 Q2 uh, Q3 Q4 right so basically like a four mm -hmm. point uh, a four mm -hmm. point phase is defined by a sequence so. It's always kind. Of, it's always kind of hard to break the sequence, right? And say, oh, actually, I want this point in that sequence in order to not come up with uh, crazy, crazy uh, overlapping meshes, right? So I, th I, I personally feel, and that's my, you know, I think, you know, it's a, it's an, it's a subjective, um, subjective uh, question. But my, I, what I personally feel is, is have a clean mesh and then do a little bit of surgery, mm -hmm. and that for me has, has, has worked. Pretty, that like microsurgery around the point is easier than like having lines that go through your like support points and then meshing around those specifically. Right, and again, I'm just uh, just because you you don't want to break that that kind of like mesh uh, that mesh mesh um, vertices the, the pattern, uh, yeah, the vertices, vertices and the, the way the vertices right. all like line up in that mesh stuff. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm more than happy if people want to suggest uh, something else. That, that would be great. Um, so I think I'm approaching to the to the last slide of my of my uh, presentation. I hope I hope it hasn't I hope it has been um, interesting for the majority of the people. But so I, I found online, and just because just because as I mentioned earlier, the kind of like the Lucas Museum is is uh, more of a confidential project. Um, I just wanted to, sh to show to the to the to the group here. What uh like the the the, the basically the um, the scale of those panels, right? Because you 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 know we're we're so used on the so used of like rotating around, zooming in, zooming on, and 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 play around with the buildings like they're basically you know objects that can live on our desk. But you know in the reality, those those panels are like are huge. Uh, and there's a lot of work going into them. So basically, uh, going like I from one, two, three, four, you can see how the mold is created, right? And those molds can take um, up to like 12 weeks or so, or even even more. Um, this is actually from the Dior flagship uh, store in Seoul. Uh, you guys are free to look it up. Uh, it's a pretty cool project. Um, and basically, so you know, once the FRP is in a sense casted, then you can see. How it comes up with a backup structure, and and basically it's, it, it it follows that that principle of the of the uh, in a sense like unitized curtain curtain wall, right? So uh, yeah, that's that's what I had to share with you guys today. Um, again, I'm uh, I'm sorry if you know if I couldn't show more. It's you you know I'm sure most of us are working with projects that are confidential. I try to keep it generic, but at the same time uh, show you uh, what what we did. Uh, things that we've learned, uh, and yeah, I'm. I'm yeah, it's open interesting to, to see how this idea of meshing can can carry. I mean, obviously, it carries over from project to project, and you learn and you grow. Um, and I do think I know the zebra stripes have been something that are really helpful. Um, and uh, yeah, all right. Well, I'm looking at the chat here. If you have any questions, uh, I'm looking here, and as they come up, I'll try to shoot them over. We'll stay live for a few minutes um, after questions go dead. So as long as you guys keep asking, we'll keep answering and I see a couple jumping up here. So um, first, what's the best way of triangulating a quad mesh? Some GH plugins give weird results, flip diagonals, etc. cetera. Um, what are your thoughts around that? The, the, triangulate, the triangulate tool that uh, is native to, to Grasshopper, uh, I think it has been pretty consistent for me. 
I know Weaverbird has uh, some additional some additional tools for that. Weaver, like the um, uh, it's uh, Giulio Piacentino, right? Uh, I, it, Weaverbird is it's a really cool tool that I, that for me has been has been used uh, super helpful. It also also has the ability for you to thicken the mesh, which is I get it. It's it has been under development for a lot of years, but if you have if your if your mesh is quite simple and thank God with uh, the quadri mesh is your meshes are simplified enough it, it can work it can work in um it can work in a pretty pretty consistent yeah. way yeah. one of the other people in the chat uh horse said that it uh, to try the engon remesher um i don't know if you've used that no no I, and i'll tell you down just to look at that we're all teaching each other all together i love this that's, that's love exactly that. how this works um, those molds, the one that you were showing on the screen, do you know more about how they were constructed? Um, do you think they used CNC? Uh, I can't really, I can't really speak to the, to the, the, the molding. Uh, it goes back to the fabricator. Uh, we're mainly, we're mainly involved on the, um, on kind of like the end, the end result and, and making sure that the surface quality is, is adequate and, and up to our standards. But uh, yeah, so I can't I can't really speak to that. I I can bring back the um, the presentation or uh, or I can uh, follow I've up. Caught with some, I, I've caught it. I've caught the last screen you had, so I'm showing that again. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, sure let me see if there were other questions here that came up as we're going. You have you have huge kudos. Someone said this is the best presentation they've seen on this topic so thanks to you, um, Thank you for that guys. and i'm not seeing any other questions let me think here what um what else i'd like to ask and then we can just uh close um rhino or grasshopper what's your preference for working with meshes and surfaces when would you choose rhino and when would you choose grasshopper so uh, so in general like i think so i think Okay, this I don't think it's a simple answer to that in a sense, but um, those are the best. What I what I really try to avoid doing is using grasshopper without having a plan. I, I'm not necessarily replying to your question, but um, but that's but I just wanted to share to share like a, a like a, a principle, right? So, um, I th so in a sense for and for a lot of people that don't really use heavily grasshopper, that's a in a sense uh, a misunderstanding. So grasshopper is basically grabbing what um, a rhino commands, right? Mm -hmm. So the, and there are some rhino commands that haven't been exposed in, yet to grasshopper. So it could be, it could be that something lives in rhino and doesn't live in grasshopper. So I would definitely, I would definitely try even the simple commands in rhino, make sure that, you know, uh, they're, you know, they're the capabilities of rhino um, are not met and then, you know, because a lot of people think that if I go to Grasshopper, then I'm gonna, you know, magic happens. Magic happens, but it's in a sense it calls it calls it calls like functions of Rhino. So to, to, to maybe I can respond to your question saying that basically Rhino has a, a bigger library, if you will, right? And and then and then Grasshopper has a little bit more of a has um, has a snippet of that library. I think they're they're kind of like growing together now, but. For the you know, I, I think as a heavy user yourself, you would you would you would agree that in the past you know we when we started using that it, you know more less and less um, there were there were actually commands in Rhino that were not available in, in, in Grasshopper. So to answer your question, I would start in Rhino, make sure that uh, whatever I need um, or you know things that I that could help could help me are available or not, and then if they are available, then I would just check Grasshopper to see. If I can scale that command in in um, in a parametric environment now. All right. With no other questions, I'll ask two more, and then we can close. First, how did you get into? Uh, first, if actually reverse the order, um, what would you recommend for someone who wants to learn how to do this type of work? What would you recommend they learn? Again, like uh, as a visionary like you, I always, I always, I always tell my try to tell myself to look outside of your comfort zone right so if you if you want if you want to there there are other industries there are other, especially in this type of work there are other industries that are way, are way ahead of architecture right so the car industry the naval industry there, so there's there's a aerospace. lot of like this aerospace correct so there's a lot of there's a lot of industries that are that are that um where the the surfaces and the surface treatment and 
and all of those um, really uh, high fidelity in a sense services are, are are more critical there rather than architecture because it, it, let's face it right in architecture you can design something great and the fabricator might might might, might screw that up so in a sense you there's a nothing against our fabricator friends we love <laughs> that they can create lots of, of course. So i'm just saying right like I, I think that i think the milling process the milling process on like sculptures or, or like or spaceships is is a, is way more is way more advanced. That's 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 all I'm saying. So, um, all yeah. Right. Last I'm question fine. then. Last How question. did you get into enclosure engineering or enclosure design? So I've been always fascinated fascinated by by crazy shapes. I don't know. It just comes with it. Just comes to as a personality. Uh, just coming from a heavy mathematical background, I was always intrigued by by complexity. Uh, that that I was fortunate enough to to be able to translate that into into architecture, and so kind of in a sense I didn't end up. It kind of like found me along the route. Um, so yeah, hopefully, hopefully yeah. that was it. All right, um, I, you you get to choose the which project because I don't see which one. But the next qu last question, which is actually coming from the chat here, is how many iterations did it take you before you got it just the way you wanted on the surface? And you can answer that from your own or from how many iterations of different design and sculpting, because you talked about how you were getting different sculpted designs. So take that wherever you want. Um, but how many iterations did it take from initial concept to, to actually getting it to be fabricatable? Or, yeah. I can't really I can't really pull a number out of my head, but I can tell you that I, I, that I, I had enough iterations and, and the rest of the team enough to give us PTSD. So, <laughs> you know, it's, in a sense, we're sleeping and we're like still thinking of, of oh my God, like the surfaces are coming back. Yeah. Uh, it, it has been an interesting process. Uh, sorry to, uh, to yeah, joke, joke aside. It has been an interesting process. Um, there were a lot of iterations. Uh, architects are, you know, designers are always changing the shapes. You have to reevaluate. You have to redo the same process. So you have to have this process nailed down in a sense, right? So. Um, in order for you to to adapt fast to the design changes, right? And that's the important thing. Yeah. Well, um, thank yeah. you so much well, for coming on the Your Desk University thank show. You thank you for me. all those who are participating. And we look forward to future chats um, down below. And with that, I will close. So thank you, everyone. And we will see you later. Thank you, everyone.